Good morning. Thanks for watching our digital service. Isn't watching or listening at home great? If you don't like a song, you fast forward. If the sermon gets boring, you can pour another cup of coffee. You can watch in your pajamas. But we do miss seeing you, and I bet you miss seeing your friends. We are at a point where some may stay at home, some may stay away because they're concerned about the virus. Others are watching because they're traveling during the summer. A few watch from Brazil, Indiana, and Virginia. We also understand why you can't come. We have a prayer as we prepare these services, that God will renew your soul. Maybe it will be a song, possibly a prayer, or even a few words in the sermon that revive your spirit. Thanks for coming and welcome to the worship of the living God. Pray with me. O oh God of justice, we bring to you our sin of injustice and we lay it at your feet. We pray sincerely for you to forgive our selfishness and our lack of concern for the poor and hungry all around us. Help us, God, never to mistreat people who are weak and helpless, but rather to become a soothing balm to their souls and bodies. Show us how to practice pure religion in our own lives by seeking opportunities to serve others. Change our hearts, O oh God, until we are recreated in your image of fairness and justice for all people. Make us generous in love and mercy to everyone we meet. Amen.
John would ask me to be the one to preach just nine days before the election. I believe that our vote is, is a kind of prayer that tells us what kind of world that we want to live in. Some of you know that I love keeping up with politics. I watch a variety of news sources from progressive to conservative. In my car, I listen to both conservative talk radio during the week and on the weekends, I listen to PBS. In doing so, I hear all of the rhetoric from both sides. And moreover, it sounds like we don't just disagree with each other, but that we live in completely two different worlds. Guess what? Nothing is new under the sun. In Jesus' day, it was the same with the Jews and the Samaritans. They, they literally lived in two different worlds, divided by region, practice, and thought. So with just a few days before our election, I thought it might serve us well to discover what we can learn from Jesus and how he dealt with the deep divides he experienced in his culture. So let's turn the gym. That's an old, old Jewish term that rabbis use to describe interpreting scripture from different perspectives. It's like scripture, like scripture is a big diamond. And every time you turn the gym, light is reflected from a different perspective and you see something beautifully new. That's what we're going to do today. The perspective we will see today comes from the writings of Debbie Thomas's book, Into the Mess. I highly recommend that to you. And notes from a sermon by Cody Sanders. Preachers have often mistreated the central character in this story that we often title The Woman at the Well. For my entire life, I was taught that this woman was promiscuous and immoral. The good news of this story was always something like, God even forgives the sins of such a woman. But listen carefully as this story is read again to you. The fact is, nowhere in this narrative is the woman described as promiscuous. Nowhere does Jesus call her a sinner, sexual or otherwise, or tell her as he tells so many others to go and sin no more. This is not a story of morality. It is not a story about, G about Jesus liberating a woman from promiscuity. It is a story about Jesus revealing himself as the Messiah to a fellow human being in whom he sees genuine spiritual hunger, a learned and engaged mind, and a tremendous gift for evangelism, preaching. So let's begin with hearing and listening to the story by what it actually says. Our scripture today is the story of the woman at the well found in John 4. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, 
Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Now you have heard what the story actually says. For starters, Jesus' dialogue with the woman at the well is the longest recorded conversation in the New Testament. Moreover, she is the first person and the first ethnic and religious outsider to whom Jesus reveals his identity in John's gospel. And this might be the most significant of all. She is the first believer in all of the gospels to become an evangelist and to bring her entire city to a saving experience of Jesus. I want to share with you four observations from this story. First, Jesus breaks religious and cultural rules to make the encounter even possible. By the time Jesus meets the woman at the well, the hatred between Jews and Samaritans is ancient, entrenched, and very bitter. The two groups are divided and disagree about everything that matters. Sound familiar? They disagree about how to honor God, how to interpret sacred scripture, how and where to worship. They practice their faith in separate temples, read different versions of the Torah, and avoid all social contact with each other whenever possible. The root of the hatred was that the Samaritan Jews had intermarried with foreigners and compromised their ethnic purity and their religious identities by marrying with non-Israelites. 
pure bloodlines were important. We, we get a glimpse into how much Jesus' own disciples hated the Samaritans from an incident in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. Listen. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem, they passed through a Samaritan village. However, the villagers did not welcome Jesus because he was headed to Jerusalem, a place of worship for Jews and a point of contention between Jews and Samaritans. In response, James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, asked him, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Jesus rebuked them, and they continued on to another village. This passage illustrates how much Samaritans were hated. James and John thought, well, maybe we can just wipe them all out. However, Jesus rebuked them, teaching them mercy and his rejection of violence, even against those who reject him. Let's continue. Moreover, the Samaritan is a woman, and it's not, and it's not customary or even appropriate for Jesus, a Jewish man, to converse alone with a Samaritan woman, much less ask her for a drink of water. That sort of thing is just not done. To put this in more contemporary language, the woman is the other, the alien, the outsider, the heretic, the stranger. She represents all of the boundaries that must not be broken in religious and cultural life. All of the spiritual taboos that must not be broken. But Jesus breaks them anyway. Is there anything that we can do in our contemporary lives to recover the scandal at the heart of this story, because its heart is the scandal. Not a scandal about promiscuity, but a spiritual one. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans in Jesus' day is not theoretical. It's embodied and it's real. The differences between them are not easily negotiated. Each is fully convinced that the other is wrong. Sound familiar? Again, I listen to a lot of diverse news outlets. Most of us live in a bubble of news sources and social posts that convince us that we are right and that they are wrong. What's even worse is the outright hatred that is spewed on news outlets. It's as if Jews and Samaritans were in charge of our different news stations and social media outlets. We need Jesus to intervene again. What does Jesus do when he enters into a conversation with a Samaritan woman it's radical, and it's risky. It stuns his own disciples because it asks them to dream of a different kind of social and religious order, a way forward in a different kind of kingdom. Jesus' willingness to break the rules compels us, his followers, to live into the truth that Listen to this carefully. That people are more than the sum of their political, racial, cultural, sexual, and economic identities. Jesus calls us 
to put aside the stereotypes that we carry, the prejudices that we nurse, the social and the cultural lines that we draw. He invites us to risk listening to each other in erasing the lines that divide us. He invites us to look at and to actually see the Jew or the Samaritan, the Democrat, the Republican, the pro-life, the pro-choice, the open border, the closed border, black, white, ultra-rich, poor, and in Jesus' day, Greek, that's us, and Jew, male, female, slave, and free. He invites us to look at any other and see a sister, not a harlot, or a heretic, or a foreigner, or any outsider as a threat, but to see everybody as kin and beloved children of God. So I ask, where might God be calling you to break a rule, to transgress a boundary, to embrace a stranger? And the really big question is, what lines has Jesus erased in order to find you? Second, Jesus leads with vulnerability. Jesus is seated at the well at high noon in the desert heat. He's tired out and thirsty. Jesus wins this woman's trust by humbling himself, by naming his own thirst, for asking her for something that only she can give him. Jesus' disarming honesty opens the door for a spiritual seeker to find new life and then share that new life with her entire city. So the question for us is, how can we be vulnerable and transparent with each other to listen and actually hear those with whom we disagree? How can we be vulnerable and transparent and speak with others about our shared values. Third, Jesus tells her the truth without shaming her. He knows about her life. You are right in saying that I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. This is the sordid revelation that commentators often point to when they try to make a case for the woman's sexual wantonness. But there are a variety of reasons why the Samaritan woman might have the past that we think she has. Perhaps she was married off as a child bride, then widowed, and passed along among her dead husband's brothers as per the Levitical marriage practice of the day. Maybe her various husbands abandoned her because she's ill, disabled, or worse yet, infertile. Maybe she's a, vic a victim of abuse. Whatever the case, we know that in first century Palestine, women do not have the legal power to end their own marriages. The authority to file for divorce rests with men alone. So divorce can't be her sin. There's a great deal that we can't know about this woman's history. What we can infer is that she prefers to be invisible. For whatever reason, she doesn't expect the other women in the town to accept her, so she heads to the well in the scorching heat instead of the cool of the morning. But Jesus comes along and sees her. 
He sees the whole of her. He sees her past, her present, and her future. All that she might become, and he names it all. But he names it without shaming her or condemning her. He is saying to her, I love you. I see you. Now see who I am. I am the one in whom you can find freedom and love and healing and transformation, spirit and truth, eternal life, living water. Drink of me and live. Just as he does for the Samaritan woman, Jesus invites us to see ourselves and to see and to see each other through the eyes of love, not judgment, to see each person's wholeness. Can we see and name this world's brokenness without shaming? Lastly, Jesus endorses the woman's proclamation. When Jesus tells the Samaritan woman who he is, she leaves her water jar and runs back to her city and says, Come and see a man who has told me everything that I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? There's so much to love about this moment. I love that in her excitement, the woman forgets all about her water jar. I love that her need to share her sacred experience overwhelms her desire to remain anonymous and invisible. I love that her history, once the source of such great pain and secrecy, becomes the evidence that she uses to proclaim Jesus' identity. She shares her faith even though it is so young and in process. He can't be the Messiah, she questions. Can he? Most of all, I love that Jesus honors, blesses, and validates the woman's proclamation. John writes that Jesus stays in the woman's city for two days so that everyone who hears her testimony can meet him directly and see that the woman is a credible and reliable witness. John 4.39 says that many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Now to finish up, who is speaking good news into your life? It might be a person that you'd least expect it to come from. Remember in probably the most famous Samaritan story, the Good Samaritan, there is often an overlooked message. We all tend to identify with the Samaritan the good neighbor, right? But an overlooked diamond, remember, is that the man almost dead in the ditch is saved by a Samaritan, the person he most hates and disagrees with is saving his life. The story is in response to the question, what must I do to have eternal life? Or today we might say, what must I do to get saved? Maybe it's that we have to value relationships so deeply that we allow the person we disagree with about everything, the person whose way of worshiping seems completely wrong to us, the person whose politics we strongly are at odds with, the person we, that we might even see as our enemy, may actually save us because relationships are more important 
than issues. So in the most unlikely places, through the most unexpected voices from the minds of the disempowered, the marginalized, and the most overlooked, God speaks and living water flows. May we have ears to hear, hearts to receive, and courage to share what we have been given. So let me summarize very quickly. First, we may have to risk cultural boundaries to reach out and start conversations with those people we most disagree with. Second, in these conversations, we have to be vulnerable and honest with each other. Third, in our conversations, we should never shame anybody for who they are or what they believe. We need to see each other as whole persons who need love and forgiveness. And last, we must, especially, we must especially believe the testimonies of women and the marginalized, the invisible, and validate their stories. We must understand that God's grace is, is extended to everyone even our enemy. So let's have grace with each other and our neighbors in the days ahead. The journey forward is shaped by the collective will of the people. Come together and listen, love, show kindness, and build a future that reflects our shared values. For in Christ, there is no Jew or Greek Samaritan. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. There is no us or them. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father, in the days ahead, may we have a deep understanding that the person in front of us, the person behind us, and the people beside us are beloved children of God. You created a diverse humanity, and in that diversity we can find unity. For nothing separates us from your love, nothing. You know our past. You experience our present alongside us, and you will be with us in the future. Help us to be people of love and grace, and give us your peace. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, who loved all people. Amen. Draw the circle. Draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we will stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song. No one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide.